I titled the, my uh, presentation um, The Underground Railroad Honor Among Thieves. And the reason why is because Underground Railroad conductors were in fact thieves. What they were doing was illegal. Uh, they could be prosecuted, uh, imprisoned, um, fined, uh, all of that. So um, while we look upon them with uh, um, favor in, in, uh, to, from today's viewpoint, what they were doing was stealing other people's property. So that was the uh, legal standpoint. So in the, at least in this particular instance, I believe, and I think it's a common, uh, uh, common belief, that there are, was honor among these particular thieves. So what was the Underground Railroad? Uh, the Underground Railroad was the first civil rights movement in the United States. Um, people of various ethnicities and religious beliefs worked together in an informal network of safe houses, um, of which this is uh, presumed to be one, and escape routes to help enslaved African Americans to freedom in the northern states and to Canada. It is a, uh, uh, other than the terminology used, it ac actually has absolutely nothing to do with uh, uh, trains or anything like that, um, uh, or even tunnels running, uh, running underneath the ground. Now the reason that people would ultimately want to be, uh, make their way to Canada, simply getting across the Ohio River at that point, uh, which was um, you know, the dividing line, if you will, simply getting across the river was not sufficient. Um, just like today, um, if someone is caught doing something wrong, they can be extradited. So just because someone made their way into Ohio, they, uh, it's a common um, misconception that uh, the people have today is, well, as soon as they get across the river, they're free and they're all good and everything. That's not true. Um, the blacks had to uh, had to carry with them manumission records, uh, which was a legal document filed at the courthouse. In fact, I have a copy of one here um, of one of the Underground Railroad conductors I will speak of. Uh, but a uh, manumission record, and it gives, gives a uh, written physical description. Um, you know, obviously, photographs would not have been uh, common at that time, so there's a written physical description. They'd have to hold keep that on their person at all times in order to be able to prove that they were legally free. And it wasn't just law enforcement that can ask them, ask uh, any black person to produce it. Uh, anyone could. Any white person could say, I want to see your freedom papers or your manumission record. And they had to keep that on them at all times. So I'll actually uh, pass it around if anybody wants to look at it. This is of a, a a gentleman who I will discuss by the name of uh, Gabe Johnson, uh, and he was freed in uh, 1827 when he was two years old, and I have it transcribed here at the bottom if anybody wants to. Uh. So how did the Underground Railroad get its name? Well, to be honest, most people really aren't certain, but the most commonly held belief is from, uh, comes from the 1830s, and a gentleman who was enslaved, his name was Tice Davids. Uh, he was enslaved in Maysville, Kentucky, and uh, you know, like any other human being, desired the freedom. Um, he decided to make a, uh, make a run for it one day and jumped into the Ohio River. Of course, it wasn't as big as it is, big as wide or as deep or anything like it is now. Um, but he swam, swam across the river and exited the river in Ripley, Ohio. His owner was there and found out about it and obviously wanted to reclaim his property, um, his escape property, but he didn't want to get wet. So he looked for a John boat to get him across the river. He made his way over into Ripley, Ohio, which was a uh, hotbed of abolition activity at the time, um, and uh, looked all around and couldn't find him. I mean, the guy had just flat disappeared. And uh, in frustration, um, he said, well, he must have disappeared on some underground railroad then. He was just, the guy just vanished into thin air. Uh, and with that, with that phrase right there, the term underground railroad was coined. So why would uh, the underground railroad have been in this area? Well, Ohio borders the slave states of Kentucky and Virginia. 
which is where we would 100 and some odd years ago, this is where we were. Uh, West Virginia didn't become a state until June the 20th of 1863. Um, also, Kentucky was a breeding ground for slaves. As uh, Kentucky is known for horses and tobacco and things of that nature now, at that time they were also known, as known for their slaves, their high quality slaves that they would breed. Um, and they were sold, uh, sold all over. Um, in fact, one common place for them to be sold was uh, just a couple of blocks from Rupp Arena. Um, right now, there's a, uh, a glass pavilion uh, about, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say three or four blocks from Rupp Arena, and uh, uh, it's near an old courthouse. Um, and the glass pav pavilion is called Cheapside. Uh, the reason, and the reason that it was called Cheapside is because there would be different prices for different types of slaves. Uh, a slave that was old and infirm obviously would fetch a lower price. Um, an infant would perhaps be a little better because there's at least some uh, uh, possibility of, of uh, uh, recovering your investment. Um, but the prime as far as for males <clears throat> would be anywhere from uh, 18 to about 25 years old with some type of skills, whether it be a blacksmith or something like that. Um, those, those would have uh, brought the most amount of money. As far as for females, um, generally um, 13 to maybe 20 years old. Um, and primarily, well, the reason behind that was for breeding purposes. Uh, um, and it was, uh, it was uh, Harriet uh, Jacobs who had, who had lived a life enslaved. Um, she said that a mother's worst fear was that her daughter be, bo be born beautiful. Um, I don't need to go into the... Uh, uh, into the reasons why that may be, um, but I think we can all fully understand why that would be. Now, also, uh, generally speaking, as far as the uh, as far as slavery was concerned, <coughs> the further uh, people were sent in the South, further south they were sent, the uh, the harsher the treatment was. Uh, the uh, the work was harder, the weather was more severe, and uh, so those who were those who caused issues with their owners would often be sold down the river. So if you've ever heard the term being sold down the river, that's where it comes from. And being sold down the, uh, being sold down the river was in fact a viable threat. Those who beat their slaves were called crackers. Of course the uh, term is still um, used loosely today, uh, a derogatory term, but um, Obviously, you see a gentleman here who had been severely beaten, obviously over a period of time. Uh, he has scars upon scars. And what would often happen when someone would take a lashing like that, they would then pour brine over top of them. So you can only imagine not only the pain of having the, the lash inflicted on your bare back, but then to be covered in brine as well. Uh, um, the pain had to be excruciating. And he would have been a, um, a prime candidate to be sold down the river. Now, the fact that he also had this much scarring on him would have also affected his sale value because it would have shown that he would have been diff difficult to control. So that would have lowered his value as well. John Parker, who was a uh, conductor up in, uh, another, another conductor up in uh, Ripley, Ohio, uh, he said uh, he had been born enslaved as well and later attained his freedom. But he said it was not the physical part of slavery that made it cruel and degrading. It was the taking away from a human being the initiative of thinking and of doing his own ways. So while the, uh, while the man was severely beaten and that looks painful, uh, having his freedom taken was, was the worst part to him. Um, knowing that he had no decisions that he could make for himself. Uh, what he wanted to eat, you know, what he wanted to do for a living or anything, all of that was mandated to him. What time he could go to, was going to go to sleep, what time he was going to uh, wake up. 
all of that. Everything was mandated. And here we have a, uh, an infant child here uh, being, taken, being taken away from his parents uh, by, by a cracker here. You see him wielding the whip. Now the Ohio River, in uh, Negro spirituals, uh, the Ohio River was refer referred to as the River Jordan in reference you know, to the uh, biblical days. One song that was common was a song by the name of Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And I'm confident most, if not everyone here, is, has heard it at least once or twice. Um, but I want to pay a point out a couple of things here in the midst of this song. If you'll look, here in the midst of this song, um, I look over Jordan, which is the Ohio River, so I look over, the, over Jordan, and what do I see? A band of angels coming after me. If you get there before I do, tell all my friends that I'm coming too. So right there in the midst of a song that's being sang and, and uh, uh, people assuming that they're talking spirituality, and in fact they are, uh, they're also passing, passing along secret messages saying, hey, we're getting ready to make a run for it. Meanwhile, other people who are just listening to it thinking, well, they're just talking about Jesus, which is great because they have no objection to that whatsoever. We're getting ready to make our escape. So uh, next time, perhaps, if you, hear the, if you hear the song, you'll think, wow, there really is kind of a hidden meaning in there. But it has to be pointed out. Okay, these are talking about the conductors as well. Now this comes also from John Parker, and he said, to properly understand the positions that these men were placed in by my hiding aboard their crafts, they're talking about their watercrafts, you must go back to the times of which I am speaking. I was worth $1,800, which roughly is $48,700 today. So what I was talking about earlier, these people being thieves, they weren't stealing just small property. Think of your vehicle, or what have, what is it, whatever it is you own that's worth roughly $50,000. Maybe it's a vehicle, home, what have you. Or you have a, have a you know, whatever it is. Uh, maybe you have a lump sum of $50,000. If you so, I, I could use a small interest-free loan, but um, we won't go there. Um, and then someone taking it. You know, your new car. Yeah. Uh, for the, for the young men and young ladies I see here and everything else, you know, you got this new car and you're thinking, wow, you know, I'm, man, I am it. And somebody steals it. You're a little bit upset. Just a little bit. And you want it back. And you want it back now. And someone's going to pay for taking it. That's what Underground Railroad conductors were. If we put them in today's, uh, um, using today's, uh, scenario or whatever, eh. car thieves, high-end car thieves. No one likes them, but yet today we're celebrating them. For one to run away meant a loss of that much money, and anyone who aided me was a thief, worse than a thief, because he was an enemy to the institution of slavery. So the hand of, of the law and the anger of the people and the consolidation of the South were all in a hot bed, in a hot cry, after anyone who helped break down their institutions. The penalties were severe, not only sending the rescuer to jail, but confiscating his property as well. Man, okay, I think this is a good thing. You know, these people are being oppressed, and I want to help them out, and sure, you know, and I like the daring, and, and I feel real good about it, and you know, it makes me feel good to, to give to, to help the less fortunate, and, and you know, well, what do you mean? If I get caught, I'm going to go to jail? Yeah. And they're going to take my house and all my property, too? And my wife and my kids and everything else are going to be out on the street homeless? Yeah. Any takers? My wife, my kids, my grandkids whatever, all of them, homeless, everything I own, gone. For someone I've never seen before and I'll never see again. Th 
don't need a show of hands, just ask yourself in your own head. Any takers? I have problems looking the guy in the eye at the stop sign that's wanting two dollars because he's hungry. And I want to say that I'm willing to do everything I can for someone I've never seen before. And I see the same guy multiple times and I think, you know, he's trying to rip me off or whatever. It's two bucks or it's a dollar. And yet I want to claim I'm on some type of moral high ground. Am I? How many of us are? That's what these people are. That's what conductors were. Now here's some of the Underground Railroad routes. Uh, just, one, just local ones. Uh, the one I have specific here is, there, you'll notice a star down here. This is Burlington, which is just right across the river. Uh, Sam's, Walmart, all that. Uh, and you have uh, Guy and Dot in Proctorville. Notice no Huntington, because it wasn't there. Um, so you come across from uh, Guy and Dot into Proctorville, which was known as Quaker's Bottom at the time. There were three uh, religious denominations that were common on the Underground Railroad. Methodists, excuse me, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Quakers. And Proctorville's first name was Quaker's Bottom. So it kind of stands to reason. And uh, When I started all this uh, research and stuff, like that, I had no idea what it was. I mean, I, I mean, I'd heard about the Underground Railroad, sure, it's cool, whatever, secret, you know, wonderful. You know, and then after reading and reading and starting to research and stuff like that, I started sending, seeing these different trends and stuff like that. And uh, at least in this area, I'm not speaking nationally, but at least in this area, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Quakers, if you see that in someone's uh, um, information or in their biography or what have you from that time period, that's at least an indicator. You know, you need, ooh, let me, let me pay a little closer attention here. Um, not saying that they were involved, but uh, th there is a distinct possibility. So they make their way up to, uh, make their way down river down into Burlington, and then head, heading on out towards uh, Macedonia Church, if anyone knows where that is. Uh, it's this church here. Uh, um, if you go uh, across, from, across from Lowe's and Murphy's, and, and that's uh, Macedonia Road, and just straight on out through there, and you'll end up coming across this church out there. But then they would make their own way out. Uh, you have uh, different furnaces and stuff like that. You have the Ironton coming into starting. Ironton is informed uh, by uh, John Campbell, who grew up in Ripley, with the, where I was talking about the Underground Railroad up there and all that. He grew up there. He was a follower of John Rankin, one of the uh, most Reverend John Rankin, uh, one of the most well-known and respected abolitionists and Underground Railroad conductors in the United States. In fact, John Rankin died in Ironton, Ohio, which at the uh, site of the uh, Lawrence County Historical Society. They have his bed, the bed that he died in and, and all of that. But they make their way up following the various furnaces. When Campbell came here, he, in, he, ha, he brought people with him or got investors and all that, and they started building iron furnaces, hence why Ironton got its name. But also, and I'm not saying uh, all of them, but a large portion of them were also abolitionists and also were involved with the Underground Railroad as well. So they would literally move from furnace to furnace to furnace to furnace. And you think, well, that's just, that's going to be easy. Well, that's not saying that everyone else that worked there was, though. You know, that's just like saying somebody owns a company now or what have you, and, and they don't drink a drop. That does not mean that every employee there does not drink. So it, it's not, it's, it still has to be really covert. This is the uh, original courthouse in uh, Lawrence County in Burlington there. It's back, back behind Lowe's in a small park there in the s curve. It's called the Commons now. Uh, but this was the original courthouse. And this would have been where the uh, manumission records and stuff like that would have been kept at the time. So what about the conductors? Uh, they had a greater desire than just to right a wrong. They had conviction. Like I mentioned earlier, think of all the things that they were risking. 
not only for their, of themselves but of their families. Um, they were rich. They were poor. They were black. They were white. They were biracial. Um, Methodist, Presbyterians, and Quakers were heavily represented. They were watched by their neighbors, threatened by the authorities. Once again, they were doing the stuff they were doing was illegal. They were betrayed by their friends. You have to think of all of the re rewards that are uh, being offered. Somebody steals your brand new truck, you're going to offer a reward. And guess what? Somebody next door, hey, I know this guy down here, he stole it. And you know, that's worth you know, $500 to me. I'm going to turn him in. Uh, once word came that the runaways were on their way, the whole countryside turned out not only to stop the fugitives, but to claim the reward for their capture. The success of the fugitives was absolutely, absolutely dependent upon a few conscientious men north of the line who received no compensation. In fact, they made themselves poor, serving the helpless fugitives who came to their doors. When people are making an escape in a situation like that, I mean, they're not carrying a whole bucket full of food and, you know, a backpack full of food and goodies and everything else with them. I mean, they're off and running. Well, they're going to prepare a little bit, but that stuff's going to run out quick. And that type of stress and physical exertion and all that is going to burn a lot of calories. These people are going to be hungry. They're going to need money. So now not only you got to... You mean now I went, am I not only got to help this guy, but now I got to give him money too? And they're going to arrest me and take all my stuff. It just doesn't sound like a real, real winning deal to me. That's what these people were. This is here just in Burlington alone, right here. Each of these spots right here, each of these stars indicate a different Underground Railroad conductor just in that small area. And just in this small area, just of a few blocks, look how many different conductors there were. Now those are the ones that I can document. Because yeah, just like today, you know, a car thief, a drug dealer, they're not going to keep good records because what they're doing is illegal. I mean, if they get caught or what have you, just, they've just hung themselves. So you're not going to keep good records. You want to you want to keep it quiet. So documenting documenting conductors and people who were involved in, in this type of activity is difficult. You can only hope that at some time later on in their life they decided or someone else decided to come forward and to <clears throat> excuse me and tell their story. So what about the people who were seeking their freedom? Well the early fall was the most common time to attempt to escape. They commonly hid in cornfields which also allowed them to eat. Because if you're looking in here you can't see if there's anybody in there. Maybe there's one person in there Maybe there's 30 people in there. No idea. And there's a lot of food. And it's high in sugar. Um, they, were usually, they were usually strong physically as well as people of character and were resourceful when confronted with trouble. In other words, they were going to fight you to the death. Anything that could be used as a weapon was going to be. Um, and they also followed the drinking gourd which is uh, today's known as the, or even then was known as the North Star. Uh, never moves. Just keep follow, moving in that direction and just keep moving north. Ultimately, uh, the safest place for an individual to get was to get to Canada because as I mentioned earlier, the extradition and all that, you could be sent back. Once you got to Canada, there was no extradition. You, you were home free then. While you were in the United States, you, uh, even as far north as you could go, uh, the farther north you went, you can feel a little safer, but you still weren't home free. So if there's people that are, that are uh, stealing cars and stuff like that and everything else, well then you're going to have people that are going to go get, get the property back. And those guys were called slave catchers. Now this I, I particularly like and especially like to be able to say it over here, I really like this little article. Um, I remember when I was 10 years old that Bill Simmons, hope no one's related to Bill Simmons, but uh, uh, that Bill Simmons and his gang came to my father's store in search of runaway slaves. And I thought as I looked at them, they were large, fierce-looking men armed to the teeth with pistols, kn knives, and etc., and had handcuffs tied to their saddles. What a poor chance the fleeing black man would have, and my best wishes went out that the slave might reach Canada and be free. 
Their rude, boisterous, profane language with breath redolent with bad whiskey and tobacco made them very offensive. The poor colored folks gave a long sigh of relief when they mounted their horses and went out into the country on their search. Simmons was the leader of a band of slave hunters and lived over in Virginia. That's from the Ironton, Ironton Register, 8, October 14, 1852. Bill Simmons lived over in Virginia. Hmm. We're, we're in, in 1852, we're standing right in the middle of Virginia. I don't know. We don't know who Bill Simmons is, but as I said, you know, you, you come across how people are conductors and stuff like that. Now we also know a uh, 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 Bill Simmons from, you know, from this area. Well, not necessarily from this area, but assuming it's from this part of Virginia. We've just identified a slave catcher. Uh, slave hunters were constantly on the lookout for a chance to catch some poor runaway or kidnap one if they thought they could get him across the lines. So, hey, I get across the line and everything else, I'm cool or whatever, or hey, I'm even, I'm legally free. I have that manumission record and everything else. See, I'm free. It's legal. Is it? Where's your proof you're free? I strike a match, your proof's gone. So, well, I'll go to the courthouse. Well, wait a minute, you're not a person. You can't defend yourself. Well, I'll tell them, you're not a person, you can't speak. Well, this kind of sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it kind of does. Kind of does a whole bunch. But that was the law. Now, the jail over there still stands, uh, over in Burlington as well. Uh, still stands there today. It was constructed uh, 1848, if I remember correctly. And right next door to it uh, is a, currently, on Old 52, there is a white metal building, a church, uh, with a blue roof on it. That's here, the Presbyterian Church. Reverend Gamaliel Beeman came here in the, <clears throat> in the mid uh, 1820s and divided the church over the issue of slavery. He was involved with the Underground Railroad. And he said, oh no, we'll not be having any, having any of that around here. And he kicked the slave owners out. Uh, uh, 1838, my apologies. Uh, in 1838, Reverend Gamaliel Beeman and his wife Amelia moved to Burlington, Ohio. Abolitionism was then spreading rapidly and the church at Burlington held 34 members, 17 of whom were slave owners. Residents of Kentucky and Virginia, um, just across the river, Reverend Beeman was an ardent abolitionist and under the influence, under his influence, the church session dismissed the slaveholding members and the remaining 17 adopted an article excluding slaveholders from the church and the pulpit. Uh, Reverend Beeman was, uh, he was active in advancing anti-slavery and temperance and as a result he was mobbed 16 times. So, he, he got beat up frequent. Um, but he kicked out half the church. All right, have you get out. Really? I mean, I don't think anybody really wants to see their church split that fast or what have you, but he was having none of it. So what do those people do? Well, shoot, now we don't have a church to go to. They just kicked us out. We'll start our own. We'll go across there to, uh, you know, we'll go back over there to Virginia and find us a spot and everything. So they did. They went over and this comes from a, a local church history. Before the church was organized in Cabell County, the pre now listen, same story, just some slight differences. Before the church was organized in Cabell County, the Presbyterian farmers of Cabell County went in boats with their families across the river to Burlington to worship. Okay, all right, we're there, we got, we're on the same track. In 1837, Presbyterians on the Virginia side be began to th consider the establishment of a church of their own. They began to consider. I guess you kind of begin to consider when other people are telling you to get out. Good a time as any. Um, and th that same year, a movement was launched in Guyandot, a town two miles above Huntington, 
to establish an academy for the education of their youth. The Presbyterians indicated that they would subscribe generously to the enterprise if they would be permitted the regular use of the chapel for their religious services. In 1838, the building was erected and the original log house used by the church and school was called Mount Hebron. On June 30th, 1838, James Holderby and Lucy Holderby deeded to Marshall Academy, which had been named for Chief Justice John Marshall, an acre and a quarter of land. Chief Justice Marshall was a personal friend of John Laidley, a prominent lawyer, and one of the moving spirits of the project. So you have a small church over in Burlington, Reverend Gamville Beeman come in telling people that they're slave owners, y'all got to get out. They go across the river, they start, their, they start a school, or they start a church, they get with the local school and everything else, you want to use your chapel, we start, start kind of pulling our money together and everything else, and what do we have a hundred and some years later? Marshall University. Pretty neat, huh? All the way back to a small church that split over the issue of slavery. Now the 37, um, uh, 37 there were 37 slaves in, that settled in uh, Burlington. Actually, they were the second influx of, that I have found. Um, second greatest influx uh, into, into the Burlington area. The first actually preceded them by 20 some years and there was a group of 133. Um, but the 37 came and ended up settled. They were, uh, they were enslaved by John Twyman in uh, Madison County, Virginia. And they end up coming here and settling. And in fact, some of their, uh, just about a block from Sam's Club, if you know where Sam's and uh, right across the street from it is uh, Little Caesars. If you follow that and there's a little oil change place and if you go up that little alley there beside the oil change place you'll run in right into the cemetery, the 37th cemetery, which is the final resting place for many of those 37, not all of them, uh, but, a, but a significant portion. They were, uh, they were enslaved in Madison County, Virginia by James Twyman. I think I called him John a minute ago, I apologize. Uh, but this is, the, uh, this is the home, this is the plantation home where they were enslaved. James Twyman manumitted his, his slaves in 1849. He gave them $10,000, which is roughly you know, $2.06 million in today's money, uh, and other provisions for their care. So you just couldn't free someone if you wanted to. Uh, that was also illegal. You had to give them, because then they're a burden upon the state and, and all that kind of stuff and everything else, and we're not going to have any of that. So it's not the state's burden to take care of them or what have you. If you want to free these individuals, that's fine, but you need to give them some money. You need to give them a, a horse, plow, tools, stuff like that, so that they can make their own way. Um, so he gave them a little bit over $2 million and other provisions for their care. 30 of them came to Burlington. Uh, 33 were invalids who uh, stayed and were cared for in Virginia, and three women remained in Virginia. Uh, it's Jenny, Amanda, and Francis Ann were their names, and, and later on, uh, genetic testing was proven that there was, they did indeed have a biological connection with James Twyman. And then one wa named Washington was unaccounted for. Now look, a common time for, and in, it happened in this case, but it was also common other times, a common time for people to be freed would be when, when their owner was going to die. Now the thing is, you don't have any idea where you're going. Maybe I'll go to someplace good, maybe I'll go to someplace bad. You know, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. I just know this guy's gonna die and I'm, you know, I, I don't know what's up. So, um, you know, you're kinda taking a gamble hanging around or whatever. what Washington decide to do? He made a run for it. Now, did he ever, did he make it to freedom? Was he captured, sold down the river? I have no idea. Uh, but he decided he was gonna take matters into his own hands and control his own destiny. Um, because of it, now you have to think with 37 slaves and he's given away that type of money to them as opposed to his family members, not only to mention the worth of those 37 slaves and their 
you know, in their uh, entirety. 37 vehicles, 37 cars, if you will. You know, the family's like, man, I, you know, I think we ought to get this stuff. And he decides just set it all loose, set it, give it away. They weren't happy. So um, it was rumored that he was not, they did not bury him when he passed away, that they did not bury him in his family cemetery. And uh, I actually went and checked in Madison County, Virginia, and in fact, he does not have a marker. So this was a man who was a multimillionaire in the uh, uh, you know, mid-1800s and stuff like that, and he doesn't even have a tombstone. Uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful place. And this, is a, uh, this is from his brother's house, uh, the plantation, <coughs> view from where the slave quarters would have been. And these are some of the 37 here. If you, come outside, if you walk outside of uh, Walmart from the, uh, on the produce side, over there and looks directly across the river, or I'm sorry, directly across Old 52. You'll see a rock formation, this one. So walk directly, directly out of the produce side of Walmart and look old, across Old 52. This is where this picture was taken in 1909 of, the 37, of some of the descendants of the 37. This is Thomas Walker Fry. He was the leader of the 37. He was also enslaved. There's an article here about him and Mount Pisgah, which is a church up in, uh, uh, out, uh, out, uh, was it, uh, 775 in Proctorville. Uh, right there, just right off the bypass. Um, but he was the uh, leader of the, four, of the 37, also was one of them. His uh, wife's name was Charlotte, and he was one that was kind of in charge, and they all looked to him as, um, as their guiding figure when they came here. Came here, you got the uh, Macedonia Church. Uh, Macedonia Church, the markers there says uh, it was built in 1849. Actually, I believe that is incorrect. I believe that building was, this particular building was built a little later than that. And I have some documentation that supports that. Uh, but uh, it was built with the assistance of the previously manumitted slaves of James Twyman. Um, the church was a religious and social focal point of the black community and became the mother church of approximately eight Baptist churches in Ohio and West Virginia. The church was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. So as far as the uh, uh, black churches in this area, this is generally where they started. This, they generally sprang from here, at least the Baptist ones. Um, this church... Little tell you just a, a couple of odd things about it. Um, the wood from it came from here, came from Cerrito. Uh, at least that's what some uh, various documents I've seen show that the wood was brought over, was donated here by Eli Thayer, whose picture's on the wall, taken over to the river, across the river. Uh, and up the hill on ox cart and built there. So here you have a man who's wanting to be, who is obviously, who starts a town because of abolitionism and he's also donating to a black church. Not a large step really if you think about it. The man who donated the wood was the founder of, of uh, South Point. Or donated, I'm sorry, donated the land. So you have, he, who is also, and I can't, I've only seen one place and I can't document, definitively document him, but I also believe that it's, it's very possible that he was also involved with the Underground Railroad. Right there. So you have Cerrito, South Point, Burlington, and you have these conductors just all over the place. And it looks like they're in cahoots here, helping to build this church. When the church was at finally completed and um, they had a party, there were over 3,000 people showed up. 3,000 people showed up for this church. Uh, um, the odd thing, 
the really exceptionally odd thing, 3,000 people, half of whom were white. So here we are talking, you know, I, I always thought, you know, prior to seeing a lot of this stuff, um, you know, blacks were, blacks were here and whites were here and that's the way it was back then and all that kind of stuff. And it, and it was, you know, 3,000 people, half of whom were white. I mean, that's not, you know, 2,000 black people show up or whatever and, and are having a party and five white people show up to say, hey, congratulations and we're leaving. 3,000 people, half of whom were white. They, the article talks about how uh, they were celebrating. They talked about the pies and, and all this good stuff. Uh, um, and they talked about how there was uh, uh, just handshaking and hugging and kissing and, and all of these things. Something that I never would have expected until I read the article. I actually, I, it really blew my mind. But that's what happened here. Now, I'm not saying it happened, all, it happened the same way all over the United States or whatever, but it, it, happened here, at le it happened here at least one time, and it wasn't something small. And this was, this was prior to the Civil War. This is the inside of the church here, or, well, what it used to look like. It's in severe uh, disrepair now. Uh, have, the, have the divider running down the middle and everything else, you know, got to... Keep the men on one side and the women on the other and all that. Now here is, uh, in, on July 25th, uh, 2015, one of the, uh, this thing has taken me in so many different directions and stuff and, and a lot of it I just, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know how it happens. I really don't. Um, July 25th, 2015, the descendants of the Burlington portion of the 37 met the descendants of the Virginian, Virginia segment of the 37 they were reunited after 166 years. When I went down to Madison County, Virginia a few years ago, it's been 15, 20 years ago now, I guess, I took some stuff and, uh, you know, go in doing some research, and it's always good to take, take a few things and hand it off. You know, it always makes people smile, you know. Um, you know, people always like presents. And uh, anyway, um, so I dropped it off and, you know, left and, you know, had a good time and all that. And then about 15 years later, I, 10 years later or whatever, I get a phone call just out of the blue one day. Yeah, were you in Madison County, Virginia back in, what you call, uh, yeah, yeah, so we got your phone number. So what happened? Well, I guess they kind of boxed everything up and in the historical society and things kind of, I don't know, fell apart and got pushed back in the back in the attic or whatever, and then they had a change in leadership and all that kind of stuff, and then they started digging stuff out, you know. Debbie over there knows all about that. And uh, then starts, uh, and they came across this, we came across this information you had, so, and you left your phone number, so here we are. So, okay. Well, will you help us work on an article about this story? Sure. So, help them work on an article and everything else, and uh, they ran it a couple of times in a small paper, probably like the one in Cerrito or what have you. And then I get a phone call, you know, a couple of weeks later. Yeah, you helped write this article and everything else? I said, yeah. Well, I'm a descendant of the ones, the ladies that stayed behind in Virginia. You do what? Yeah. That was 160 some years ago. Yeah. Are there any descendants of the, 30, of the ones that came to where you're at? Oh, I said, oh, yeah, they're all over the place. Are you kidding? No. I'm coming up. I want to meet them. Well, all right. So, you know, they packed up. There was, there was four or five of them, I guess, and uh, they packed up, and, uh, well, I guess, you know, there's five. I think there was one more, actually, but... Um, and up they came, and uh, 166 years after they had split, their families, this collective of enslaved individuals had split and gone their separate ways and everything else, I was actually able to reintroduce their descendants 166 years later. And uh, here's, here's a group of them here. And that was, uh, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. I mean, it, you know, 
This is paper. That's paper. People. That's when it becomes real. So here they are visiting the, the cemetery there, the 37th cemetery and all that. And uh, um, Doug was, uh, Doug was, if I remember the first, uh, I want to make sure I get this correct, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. The first, I want to say he was the first black fire chief in Washington, D.C. And on September 11th, he had to re uh, respond to the Pentagon where his sister Wanda was working. So, uh, I don't know, just the connections just, I don't know. They make me feel warm and fuzzy. Ralph Leet, you were talking about the, uh, about the uh, Polly Slave family. Ralph Leet was the one who helped file the, file the papers um, to get the, slave, the kidnapped children back. He was a lawyer in Burlington and later in Ironton. He was attorney of record for the Polly family. He was re elected to the uh, House of uh, Representatives. He was a friend, close friend of Salmon Chase and later w became a friend of a historical figure by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and he said he's a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln and, you know, and, she, and, and the you know, U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice <laughs> Salmon Chase. So, I mean, he's, he's hobnobbing with some pretty high people. There's a crow flies who lived less than a mile from here. Um, in fact, he was on the first board of also on the first board of tri trustees for uh, the Ohio State University. And if it wouldn't have been for some of his influence and his political uh, uh, maneuvering and stuff like that, it's very likely, I don't know, the f probable might be a bit strong, but very likely that Ohio State could have folded up and never and just kind of went by the wayside. But yet for this guy from Burlington, Ohio, who helped f do everything he could to free the, sl free the Follies, which is John Le Legend's uh, ancestors, um, pretty cool. I mean, just that he comes from, comes from Burlington, Ohio. This talks about in Gen uh, December 20th of 1860, where some of the Pollies were trying to make their escape and they got on board a, uh, they got on board a uh, train and but they ended up getting caught. But this Jim Ditcher was one of the Underground Railroad conductors. Uh, he was known as the Red Fox of the Underground Railroad. And he's buried down in uh, the Woodland Cemetery uh, down in Ironton. If you're going through Ironton and you see that bridge going towards Ironton, you see on 52, you see the bridge and it's like, how do I get on either side? And there's a cannon up there. He's buried not far from the cannon. Uh, but he was called the Red Fox of the Underground Railroad. He was biracial. He was tall and thin with an Indian complexion. And Gabe Johnson, whose manumission record's floating around here, uh, said he saw, he took more chances with his life than any man I ever saw. I've known him to have a pistol stuck in each ear. Anyway, this is John, Le that was John Legend's ancestors. And this is where they came to uh, doing some of the filming and everything. And then they're out, out Judge Darrell Pratt, the, uh, had the, the Freedom Trial in, uh, out in Wayne County. Here it is in, in the retroactive ruling of freedom. And Jim Hale is a friend of mine. He was the next of kin. He filed it out there and uh, he filed a petition which ended the longest active fugitive slave case in U.S. history. Uh, the Polly children, after a 162 year long court case, were legally free at last. So, um, People ask, what does that really do? I guess they, they really don't understand because it, it shows that at least justice was served. And if you ask Jim and, or the Pollies, their family, I can assure you it meant a great deal to them to get that ruling of freedom for their... Um, so the longest active fugitive slave case was ended here in Wayne County in 2012. Uh, as a result of all that, uh, and this is Jim. They have a ghost walk down there. And he, he portrays Ralph Fleet every year uh, in, in honor of the man who tried to free his ancestors. And uh, as soon as that happened, as everybody ended up out at Macedonia Church and was ringing the bell. And uh, 
perhaps one of the sweetest sounds I think I've ever heard. Gabe Johnson, since I showed that around, showed that around and everything, have it passed around. Gabe, Gabe Johnson, <clears throat> the one with the manumission records around here, he was born in slavery in Pennsylvania County, Virginia. He came to Burlington at age two uh, when his mother was freed. Uh, his mother, Matilda, was a cook at the number two, which was one of the three hotels that sat over on, on the public square over there by the courthouse in the commons. And uh, he worked with another... Uh, there was also another Underground Railroad conductor there that worked with him, and his name was Philip Lynch. So you had all these people that are all up and down through there. But he worked on steamboats, and he also worked in, as a janitor in the courthouse for 16 years. Thinking, okay, well he's you know he's pretty well respected and everything else. He's a janitor. What in the world's he doing there? What person in the courthouse can move from place to place, gather all sorts of information, and no one ever see him? He was there for 16 years. Yeah, they never saw him. Oh, well, he's just yeah. We we'll pick this up. No, sure, okay. And he's just he knows everything that's going on. He knows everything and nobody sees him and if you go down to uh, BW3's down in uh, Ironton if you go around back uh, you may be able to see it during this type of year you'll this place up uh, a hillside and it's all stone it's called Table Rock and that's one of the uh, that was where they would run uh, people seeking their freedom they would run them across there and in fact, there was one place up there, uh, they talked about they hid, hid people in a cave there underneath Table Rock. And me, this is a few years back, but uh, I had to go snooping. I had to find this cave. <laughs> Got to find it. Well, I didn't find a cave, but I found what was an overhang. And I don't have any idea whether, you know, because it can mean anything. I don't want to make an assumption or what have you. But in this overhang... I found the initials J.D., perhaps Jim Ditcher, perhaps John Doe. I like, I like Jim Ditcher better, but, um, you know, could, could be anything, you know, but uh, uh, it was pretty, it was, really was pretty cool to think, you know, I really wouldn't classify it as a cave, but more of an overhang, but, you know, I guess that's kind of open in t to interpretation. And then Gabe Johnson, he moved to Ironton in 1854. And he said, I'm the first man that established anything like a systemized road here in Ironton. I and a guy by the name of James Ditcher. He was also a barber in Hanging Rock in Ironton and a janitor at the courthouse for 16 years. Along with his partner, Jim Ditcher, he operated between Portsmouth and Proctorville, a distance of about 65 miles. Um, he lived at 95 Adams Street in Ironton. Um, about a block east of where the old Ironton Russell Bridge was. Um, he attended Quinn Chapel AME Church in Ironton and donated a stained glass window bearing the names of him and his wife. And he also attended the State Colored Convention of 1873, which focused on political injustice and civil rights. So this man was, um, they sent him, he was very influential, uh, very well spoken, well read. Uh, and in fact, this is Quinn Chapel here and the, um, the stained glass window that he donated is still in their sanctuary today with his name across the bottom, him and his wife's name across the bottom. Um, when, in his, in his uh, obituary, he said he was a leading colored man and was always on the side of sobriety, religion, and education. He was a good citizen. Uh, well thought of by everybody, and his death will bring many old friends a sense of regret and sorrow. So, with that, I'm uh, I'm gonna. I think I've gone further than I anticipated.